Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I am a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pines with Aquinas. In this episode, I thought that we could talk about Providence, because, uh, it's funny, I kind of pronounce it like people from Providence pronounce Providence. Um, I thought that we could talk about Providence because it seems to come up with some frequency in conversation. So you're chatting with somebody and they're like, yeah, this thing was such a coincidence. And then somebody else in the conversation is like, wasn't a coincidence, it was Providence. And then you're like, ah, maybe, hard to say, can't, can't both be true. Um, or yeah, whenever you end up talking about fortune or luck or chance or things like that, you involve yourself in a consideration of what God has control over and what God doesn't have control over, and then the part that we play in the equation. So yeah, I thought we could think about it a little bit. And in that way, be better equipped to tend towards, to seek out our destiny with, uh, yeah, with knowledge and love. All right, so let's do it. Here we go. All right, as a way to focus the discussion, I thought that we could start with a passage from sacred scripture, specifically from the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew is divided, well, some people divide it into five books, as it were, uh, insofar as it represents a new law, a new Torah. And in the Third of those, well, you have a discourse as part of each of those five divisions of the Gospel of Matthew, and in the third of those five divisions, you have what is called the parabolic discourse. So Matthew 13 has seven parables in total, the most famous of which is the uh, the parable, the sower went out to sow, uh, but then the next longest of which in that chapter is the parable of the wheat and the tares. So let's read it, let's comment upon it, and then use that as a way to sort some of our thoughts about divine providence. Boom, here we go. <clears throat> Another parable he put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Boom. Bind them in bundles to be burned. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, So let's... let's, uh, Remark, let's note a couple of features of this passage. First, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. First, the kingdom of heaven isn't compared to a place, it's, it's, it's compared to a man, so it's compared to a protagonist. And in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is pretty consistently identified with our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're ever wondering, like Providence, it seems so neutral, it seems so aloof, it seems so utterly unconcerned with me. False. Our Lord comes to you in the incarnation so as to seek and to save the lost. So you're the object of his great affection. Know that to the marrow of your bones. Next, he sows good seed in his field. Okay? So what he does is good. Our Lord desires your welfare, not your woe. He desires your upbuilding in your faith, not your breaking down. The Lord, as it were, like makes all of creation conspire towards your ongoing conversion, your sanctification. So he does good things. Uh, I think here of Romans 8.28, which reads, God makes all things work to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's not to say that God makes our lives cushy and free from suffering, but it does mean that he makes them good. All right, boom. Next, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. All right, while men were sleeping. Notice, it doesn't say while the master was sleeping. Why? Well, because the master doesn't sleep. All right, we sleep because we're weary, because we're weak. But the master doesn't sleep. So all of these things which transpire in the parable, all of these things which transpire in the context of divine providence, happen according to the Lord's knowledge. All right. So our Lord isn't surprised. It's not like you go, you know, before the Lord in prayer and say, like, yeah, I got these like really bad things that are happening to me, and the Lord's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. No, he knows, right? And he has a plan for it. All right. So while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So the bad things that crop up in our experience of life are introduced from elsewhere. All right, so maybe it's we who introduce them by human sin. Maybe it's the evil one who introduces them as the kind of outworking of his rebellion. Now, mind you, there are certain features of the material world which are just always going to be 
this way. So like lions ate antelopes, even in the Garden of Eden before the fall, because in a material world, some things, you know, are just going to have to be built up by diminishing other aspects of that material world. So, okay. When we say like evil, we mean like moral evil. Moral evil is introduced by free agents who rebel against God. So God is not the source of that evil. All right. <clears throat> and then the servants of the householder came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? So we don't necessarily know the reasons for which things transpire, but we bring those questions before the Lord, who then begins to make sense of them. Not that the Lord is responsible, you know, for giving us an entirely clear explanation as to why he does what he does, but we, we, we pose those questions with the kind of confidence that he can make sense of them, because there is sense to be made. Now, the way in which he chooses to do so is for our upbuilding in faith, so it's oftentimes obscure, but we believe that it's good. All right. And then he said to them, an enemy has done this. Again, no hesitation, no inference made. Our Lord knows because it happens within the context of his providence. The servant said to him, then, what do you want us to do? You want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Our Lord has a kind of eschatological vision here, a kind of end times vision for his providence. So our Lord isn't concerned with making everything good now, right now. He's concerned with drawing all things to himself, and specifically in our case, with drawing us to heaven. So like when St. Augustine comments this passage, he says, such is the grace of God that it can make weeds to become wheat. So our Lord doesn't permit them to root out the weeds because he doesn't despair of any soul until such time as that soul chooses definitively against him with its last breath. He says, let them grow, both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So our Lord permits a variety of things to transpire in this world, a kind of chiaroscuro, to use a cool Italian word, um, but the good and the bad, which kind of brings out, I don't know, a complexity or a subtlety or a nuance to his creation, but all with an eye towards a kind of cosmic justice and mercy, right? So he has a plan that takes into account all that happens within the field, all that happens within the confines of his providence. And notice, nothing in this parable happens outside of the bounds of the field, right? It's all within the setting of his providence. And we can trust that, we can believe that, we can hope in that. Okay, good. So that is our kind of first piece of biblical exegesis. Let's just take a couple of minutes to refine some principles with the help of St. Thomas Aquinas. The reason for which God is provident is because God knows, all right? And because God's knowledge is causal. So God causes us to be, he causes us to cause, right? And that, that movement, right, in creation or that divine activity is the fruit of his knowledge. So God is sovereign over each and over all. And in knowing all of them, God also knows all of the ways in which they interact. God has one single notion which brings together all of these different notions of created things. So God knows, you know, rocks and plants and animals and human beings and angels, each of them by name, each of them individually. But then he has an encompassing knowledge which includes those things and also all of their interactions unto the end of his glory. And that that notion is just what we mean by providence, okay? So it is one simple notion whereby God directs all things to himself. So you can think about God as like a foreman in a work project. He knows all the subcontractors. He knows all of their activities. He knows all of the ends towards which they are working. And he, he orchestrates them so as to bring about the success of the plan. Or you can think about him as a kind of battlefield general. He knows all of his different officers. He knows all of their different, you know, like whatever, caval cavalry and mortars and um, tanks and, uh, you yeah, know, like aircraft. And then you know, he knows all of their different tasks and he knows all of the different ends towards which they are, you know, working so that he can bring about victory, right? So he can vanquish the enemy. So God knows all of these different partial and particular causes, but he knows them universally and totally. And this like helps us to appreciate the fact that God isn't going to make it right 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 now, okay? Because his plan has a broader scope. His plan has, yeah, like a wider field of application. So for us it might seem like, okay, there's this thing and it's bad. I need to make it not bad. Whereas for God, he's like there's this thing and there's some aspects of it that are bad, but maybe if we permit these bad things to persist, it'll bring about a richer, a more subtle, a more complex good down the road. So I can abide this temporary bad in light of a greater glory that is to come. Um, 
So yeah, so like for instance, we might seem to depart from God's providence when we sin, when we transgress. But God can make it such that we return to his providence, and here I'm speaking a little bit metaphorically, by punishment or by the exercise of mercy, by our making of satisfaction. So God is able to move all of these different pieces strongly and sweetly while respecting the integrity of the different players on the field, right? Uh, in such a way as to, again, bring about something that is very, very good. And he only permits evil to befall in this setting so as to bring forth from it, so as to draw forth from it something that is, in fact, good. And, and uh, yeah, St. Augustine affirms that time and time again in his writings, and St. Thomas Aquinas picks up on that. So if we want to kind of summarize, at the end of the day, we know that God is good, that he works towards the good, that he calls us each by name, he knows us, he sees us, he loves us, and he tries to incorporate us perfectly into the story of that good so that we can partake of it, so that we can magnify it. So God is provident. That is good news. Do things still happen by chance, by accident? Yeah, with respect to our limited knowledge of the situation. But in the setting of the big picture over which God has competence, all things work to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Boom. All right, so this is Pints with Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe, push the bell, get emails, and love every single one of them. You don't have to do that, but I mean, it's an encouragement. And then if you haven't yet, please do check out God's Planning, G-O-D-S-P-L-A-I-N-I-N-G, which is a podcast of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph, to which I contribute, which I think is good. I'm actually pretty convinced that it's good. So check out those weekly episodes, weekend episodes, meditations on the sacred scriptures, live streams, and guest episodes. All good things. All good things. All right. Catch you next time on Pints with Aquinas. Until then, my prayers are for you. Please pray for me. Cheers.